Uh, Tony's going to come and he's going to play a song called The Lord's Prayer today, which is actually what I'm preaching on. In 1 Corinthians 11, this is the passage I usually read from when we celebrate the Lord's Supper. Um, it's when Jesus met with his disciples, and he talks about uh, every, every time that they meet together and take this meal together, they're to do it thinking about him, thinking about his, his body and his blood that, this, that these elements represent. Because without the body and blood of Christ, we have no relationship with God. Um, the Bible says, unless there's a shedding of blood, there's no remission for sin. And so the only way that we're brought near to God is through the blood and body of Christ. And so if Jesus hadn't gone to the cross and died in our place, um, then, then we would not be right with God today. Uh, it would be left to um, our own abilities, which we know the Bible says we always fall short. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And so the necessity that we have of the sacrifice of Christ is, is greater than anything else in our life. Um, God created us with a sense of purpose. He created us in, in His image. And the sin that we brought into the world marred His image and brought sin into the world. And it's only through the sacrificial death of Christ on the cross for our sins that we can be made right and be made whole again. And so when we celebrate this together, we're looking forward to that day when Jesus comes again and takes us to be with Him forever in heaven and where all things will be restored and we will be redeemed. And so we do this, we feed upon these elements as if we are feeding upon the body and blood of Christ because only His body and blood are sufficient to cleanse us from all of our sin. So I hope that today as you take of this celebration with us, that your thoughts are taken to the cross. I hope that you're thinking about what Christ has done for you. So in 1 Corinthians 11, Paul writes about this time when Jesus is talking. Let's pray. 
Father, we thank you, God, for the ability for us to visualize something here and now that recollects a day where your son Jesus died on the cross for our sins. But not only does it remind us of that moment, it reminds us of the day that those here who are believers, the day that we came to faith, the day that you opened up our eyes, the day that your Holy Spirit convicted us of our sin and we cried out for a Savior, the day that we, for the very first time, confessed of our sins and realized that we had no hope apart from Christ. Lord, it also points to a day that we're looking forward to when death and dying and pain and turmoil and war and confusion and anxiety and depression, when all those things will be completely obliterated, never to be seen again. And we look forward to that day and we know that it's only possible through the blood and body of your son, Jesus Christ. It's in his name we pray. Amen. Well, if you have a Bible, I want, you to in, I want to invite you to open it to Matthew chapter 6. In Matthew chapter 6, now we've, we've been studying the book of Romans. And, uh, and I was planning on preaching from Romans today. But the more I thought about the song that Tony played so beautifully on his trumpet, the more I thought about that, the more the Lord just began to speak to me about the Lord's Prayer and its significance, and really, its significance right now, uh, because I don't, have to tell, I don't have to tell you how the last week, and probably this, I mean definitely this next coming week, is going to be very tumultuous in our nation where we live. Um, whether it's dealing with COVID-19 or the election or politics and just the upheaval in our society, um, we face a time, we're living in a time that can be very stressful. And where we're thinking about what's going on in our world right now, we're thinking about the government, we're thinking about what kind of world our, li our kids are gonna live in uh, in the next 10 to 20 years and so on. We think about things that have happened over the last 10 years as well. And it can cause anxiety and doubt in the hearts and minds of Christians and of believers. And, and I wanted to um, spend some time in this passage today because I think it's going to encourage you. And I also know that because it's God's truth, it's God's word, um, it will have success uh, in your heart and in your mind. And so we're going to focus specifically on the, on the prayer, which by the way, we call the Lord's Prayer, but actually Jesus is teaching us how to pray. He's teaching his disciples how to pray because according to Luke's gospel, Luke's account accounts for the same, this same story. He says, but, but he says uh, that the disciples were asking Jesus, Lord, would you teach us how to pray like John does to his disciples? Talking about John the Baptist. John the Baptist evidently was teaching those who came to him, he was teaching them how to pray. And so, according to Luke, Jesus' disciples asked him, would you show us how to pray? Would you teach us how to pray? And Jesus, in Matthew, links his response to them. Matthew links it to this other conversation Jesus is having about two groups of people he tells his followers not to be like. That was his disciples during then. To, to us today, it's the church. Also, his disciples, followers of Christ. And he wants the way that we live to be distinguished between other groups of people. And the two groups of people he mentions here in Matthew chapter 6, starting in verse 5. I'm going to read. Just follow along with me in your copy of the scriptures if you have them. And I'm reading from the New American Standard Version. He says, And when you pray, you are not to be as the hypocrites... For they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and on the street corners in order to be seen by men. Truly, I say to you, they have their reward in full. But you, when you pray, 
Go into your inner room, and when you have shut your door, pray to your Father who is in secret, and your Father who sees in secret will repay you. And when you are praying, do not use meaningless repetition as the Gentiles do, for they suppose that they will be heard for their many words. Therefore, do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask Him. Pray then in this way, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Notice the two groups that Jesus distinguishes his disciples from. He says, I don't want you, he said, don't be like th this group and don't be like this group over here. And then he points to their activities and really their mindset going into why they pray. He says, first of all, about the hypocrites. He said, the hypocrites, they love to stand. Okay, so when they pray, it's, it's, it's not a, an act of humility where they get low and they bow to the ground in private. It's something where they stand up tall. They want to be seen. They like to stand and pray. They like to stand in groups of people like this and pray before people. They like to be seen on the street corners as people of prayer. They like to be known as people of prayer because that's a spiritual thing, right? Look at those people and how they pray. They prayer for pe prayerful people. Then he talks about a second group called the, uh, so he talks about the hypocrites. Then he talks about the Gentiles, the nations. Now, the hypocrites, he would be talking about Jewish people. But the, the, the Gentiles, he's talking about the nations, the, the, the pagans during this time. And something about them, he says in verse 7, he says, they use meaningless repetition. The, the word there uh, that's used in the Greek is batalageo. It means babbling. Don't be like the Gentiles who babble. They just, they just continue to babble and babble and babble and babble. And the reason that they do this, one scholar talks about the reason that this word is used is because the Gentiles, the nations, they would pray to many gods. They were polytheistic. And they'd throw Jesus in there, or they might throw God in there as one of the, the pantheon, and say, just in case we miss somebody, we want to make sure we don't offend all the gods, right? So we'll just babble, we'll just pray to everybody all the time, and maybe by virtue of the amount of prayer and the amount of words that we use and how long we pray and, and you know, all that, then maybe our prayers will be answered and heard. I want you to notice, and so does Jesus in this passage, he wants his disciples to notice that whether or not you fall into either one of those two camps, your prayers are egotistical, self-centered types of prayers. And it's not the content of the prayer itself, it's more the activity of the prayer. And so he tells the disciples, he tells us today, you need to pray differently because of, number one, who your God is. So number one, he says, when you pray as my followers, as Christ followers, as, as the church, when you pray, know your audience. Know your audience. Who are you praying to? And so he says, pray in this way. Our Father, you notice how that's plural? He's not talking to individuals only. He's talking about us as a group. He's talking about the church. When you pray, pray this way. Our Father who art in heaven. So, God doesn't get to be our subjective genie in a bottle. He's the, he's the God of the church, and He's revealed Himself through Scripture. So He says, Our God, who art in heaven, we have an audience of one. Not many gods, not many people in the audience. The hypocrites appealed to the crowds of people. They wanted to be seen by big crowds of people. The the Gentiles wanted to be heard by many gods. But we have an audience of one as Christians. One anonymous writer said, Nothing is discussed more and practiced less than prayer. That one hurts. As a pastor and a preacher and just a Christian, that one hurts. I talk, probably in my life, I've talked more about prayer in sermons like this and with you individually than I have spent in private prayer myself. That's probably true about most Christians, that we spend a lot of time thinking about prayer, talking about prayer, teaching on prayer, than we actually spend in our prayer closet. 
Another anonymous writer wrote that the devil enjoys hearing a prayer addressed to a wide audience. The devil enjoys a prayer that's addressed to a big crowd of people or that's done for the purpose of impressing big crowds of people. But we have an audience of one. This is what Jesus is saying when he says in verse 9, Pray then this way, our Father who art in heaven. He's in heaven. It doesn't mean that he's not omnipresent, that he's everywhere present, because we know that he is. But because he's in heaven, what does that tell us about what he sees happening here on earth? He sees everything. He's not like a person in the audience that you might want to impress. He sees everything. He doesn't just see you when you're praying at the dinner table. He sees you when you're not praying in your inner room. He sees you when you're not praying alone with him. He said, I thought this was supposed to be encouraging, not convicting, <laughs> right? The second thing we notice here is verse 10. Jesus tells us to check our motives. What are our motives when we pray? So he says in verse 10, pray this way. Thy kingdom come. God, your kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. When we pray God's will to be done, we remove our motives and we're asking him to have his way. Lord, have your way in my life. Lord, have your way in my country. Lord, have your way in the next election. Lord, have your way in my workplace. Lord, have your way. The pluralistic prayers of the Gentiles and the hypocrites are egocentric. They're thinking about their kingdom. That's why they want to go pray in front of people, because they're, they're thinking about their reputation as a holy person. The Gentiles are thinking about their kingdom. That's why they're addressing every God out there possible. Because they don't care which one's true or real. They just want something to work. You ever been like that in your prayer time? You're like, I, I just, I'm frustrated in my life right now. I want something to work. Why is it not working? I'll try anything. Jesus says, don't do that. No, pray to the one true God who, who really lives, who really exists. And pray His will to be done because it might be that situation that you're in that you want deliverance from, that you want God's judgment upon some other person maybe who's come against you. It may be God's will for you that you persevere through that. And He brings healing in the end. But He wants to see you through it. And He wants to see you through it so that you can see what it's like, experience what it's like to have that fourth person in the fire with you. So praying to be seen does not seek God's kingdom, it seeks our own. John Blanchard once wrote that the real secret to prayer is secret prayer. That's what Jesus is saying in here. He's saying don't, don't, don't pray just in public. Go to your inner room. It, it should be secret prayer. And that also checks your motives. Because if it's secret prayer to the one true God, then we almost can't help but ask for His will to be done. And then thirdly we see in verse 11, He tells His disciples to pray with a, an abandoned heart and full dependence. This is the one where Jesus is really hearkening back to the Old Testament where He says, pray this way, give us this day our daily bread. Several things that we notice from that verse. First of all, Jesus is saying very clearly that prayer should be a daily exercise. Prayer should be a daily exercise because it says, give us this day. In Luke, Luke says that Jesus is saying, give us each day. In Matthew, he's saying, give us this day. It is a daily 24-hour dependence upon God. And that means that sometimes we get anxious about what's going to happen in four days, like Tuesday, next week. Sometimes, sometimes we get worried about what's going to happen in months from now or years from now when we're planning and we're stressing about things. And, and Jesus is saying to his disciples, he's saying, you need to think about God on a 24-hour basis. Every time that you wake up in the morning, it's a new day. And that's the only thing God has stewarded to you right now that He's going to call you to account for at the end of it, at the end of the day. But many times we stress about 
weeks and months and years from now. And we let 24 hours go by. We let the sun come up and then go down. And we haven't spent any time with the Lord. We haven't spent any time in, his, uh, in the business of His mission. Jesus is assuming a daily prayer for His disciples. Give us this day our daily bread. He hearkens back to the Old Testament when God said to His children in Israel, when He delivered them out of the hands of the Egyptians and sent them into Canaan, He said, I'm going to feed you. I'm going to feed you daily. Bread is going to come out of heaven and you get to go and pick it up, but don't, don't take extra, right, to save for the next day. <laughs> why would you do that? I already told you I'm going to give it to you every day. So why would you not go out and get fresh bread every day? He knows that in our wicked hearts, we have the tendency to doubt Him. We have this propensity for doubt. Well, God, I'm, what, how do I know you're going to provide for me tomorrow. How can I be sure? So Jesus says, pray every day, Lord, give us this day our daily bread. Again, he's talking in a plural form. He's talking to a group of people. Give us this day our daily bread. It's what we as the church should be doing. It shows that, that we're content when we pray daily and we pray for God to give us our daily bread. It shows that we're content with what he's already provided us. When we see God as our provider and when we understand God as our provider, it can relieve worldly anxiety, things that we stress about, things that we worry about, that many, many a times are, are not within our control. We just think they are. Jesus says, cast all your cares upon me. My burden is light. My load is not heavy. It, you should not be anxious, Jesus says, when you're following me. <laughs> There's nothing to be anxious about. Don't let your anxiety over future things rob you of the next 24 hours that God has blessed you with. Then finally, he tells his disciples and he tells us to pray humbly. He says in verse 12, that we should ask God for forgiveness. Forgive us our debts as we have forgiven our debtors. Do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. My grandfather used to say in a joking, jokingly manner, I think I've shared this with many of you before, he used to say, it's hard to be humble when you're so good. <laughs> yeah. That's kind of a double-edged sword, isn't it? It is true. It is very difficult to think lowly of yourself when you're always standing up, so to speak. That's what Jesus is saying about prayer. When we pray, there should be, when we recognize our audience of one, that we're talking to the God of the universe, the one who knitted you in every single one of your mother's womb, as Paul says in Galatians knew you before you were born, knows every hair on your head or every hair that could be on your head, right? When you think about that, when you think about that, when we think about that, that should drive us to a, a position of prostration where we get low, not one where we stick at our chest and get, and get high. Matthew Henry once wrote, the greatest of men must turn beggars when they have to do with Christ. He changes everyone. And one thing that I believe Jesus is saying here also is whenever we find it difficult to pray, and, and there are times when we do, whether it's we're frustrated, we, don't, we just don't know how to pray, we don't know what to say to God, or maybe it's because we feel so distant from Him. There are times where we find it very hard to pray. There are things that have happened in our life that we cannot understand. We can't make sense out of it. How can a loving God who's all-powerful allow this to happen? Where was God when this happened? I can't make sense of it. We find it that times it is hard for us to pray. But here's one thing Jesus says. If you know God, you will never find it hard. And if you know yourself, you will never find this part of prayer difficult. And that is confession. 
I always, I always have something to ask God forgiveness for. Every time I pray, if I think about it, I will have something to say to God. I will have something to ask forgiveness for. However, many times what happens is, is if, we, if we allow our hearts to be hardened over things we don't understand that happen in life, then we can approach God and we don't confess our sin because we're not comparing ourselves to God anymore. We're comparing ourselves to other people. And our hearts become hard. And we don't ask God to forgive us of our debts because we haven't forgiven our debtors. We're looking at other people with envy and strife. So I want to close with this. Thank you for being um, so attentive this morning. Again, you can move your chairs at any moment to find shade or grab a water. But I just want to close with this. I want to encourage you. Jesus is telling us how to pray as a church. He's telling us how to pray as individuals. And nothing that is happening in our world, in your world right now, or my world, is taking God by surprise. Now, there will be a difference on what happens in our world here in Maricopa in the United States, depending upon who is our president in the next few days. Sure, there, those things will change. But not any more than, than in ancient Rome when Constantine became emperor or Constantius, his son, became emperor or Julian the Apostate became emperor or when Alexander V, who was the most wicked pope who ever lived, became pope. The church has lived and thrived and succeeded throughout time because of who our God is, not because of who rules the country that we find ourselves in. And our hope is not in the government. The hope is not in the culture. The hope is not even in the way that the state and the church operate together. Some of the healthiest times in the life of the church over the last 2,000 years have been when there's been a complete hands-off approach by the state government in the church. Now, I'm getting into politics and I don't want to. I just want to encourage you to say this. God is still on the throne and He still hears our prayers. And none of this takes Him by surprise. And so, whether these types of anxieties and these things drive you to voice your opinion on social media or have heightened debates and conversations with people at your workplace or have very serious conversations with your children or grandchildren or parents or grandparents, whatever the, the case may be, let the very first thing that it does for each one of us as Christians drive us to our knees in prayer. Whatever else this has caused us to do, let it first and let it at least and repetitively cause us to pray. Let's pray together as we close. And I just want to challenge you and encourage you to pray over the next few days, not just the next few days, but encourage you and encourage us as a church to be a church of private prayer made up of individuals who pray in private, that we would be a church that prays regularly as a congregation, and that we, we prioritize prayer, and that we begin to think about how we can be more faithful in prayer. All right? So our lunch should be here at uh, about 11 o'clock. Not sure what time it is now, but um, we have, just to kind of give you instructions before we uh, pray, drinks are over here. There's a cooler over here. We're going to have the sandwiches over here. Everything's boxed up by itself. And so I think some of the boxes are going to be turkey sandwiches. Some are going to be ham. So that's basically, that's it. <laughs> All right. And so uh, there'll be turkey boxes and ham boxes. Um, and then we have our, our photo booth over here. We'd love for you. Uh, to come give us a little bit of testimony um, of how God's working in your life or what, you, uh, what you're expecting, what you're thankful for. And um, we look forward to hanging out with you for the rest of uh, 
this morning. So let's pray together. Father, we thank you, God, for your son Jesus who died for us. Lord, help us to be people of prayer, uh, to lift up one another. Help us to lift up people that you put in our lives who don't know Christ. Lord, that we would pray for our the leaders in our country, the people that we work with, our neighbors. God, knowing that you are in heaven and you see everything. God, that you're our provider. And we're never in need when we're fed by your hand. God, thank you for your word today. We love you. We trust you in Jesus' name.